So uh, last time, I've divided this lecture up into several different parts, and last time I was kind of going through uh, where we left off, off in the uh, prehistoric Aegean, where we have uh, the Mycenaean and other Helladic mainland cultures. We had the Minoans, we had the art coming out of the Cyclades, and then we went into what's kind of known as the Greek Dark Ages. I'm sorry my throat's a little scratchy. I have really bad allergies. Um, so I, I've broken this quiz, or this quiz, oh, my brain. Okay, bear with me, students. I'm here, I promise, <laughs> okay. Um, I've broken this lecture up into several parts. So the first part of this is already recorded and posted in Canvas and on the YouTube channel, so you should be able to go find it. And in it, I go through and kind of generally tell you where we are and a little bit about what's going on in Greece historically at this time. And then we go through all the Greek gods, and then uh, we get into um, the geometric and orientalizing periods, uh, which also uh, Daedalic style art is part of that period. We talked about how during the Dark Ages there's kind of a lot of loss of knowledge at this time in Greece, but um, gradually we start seeing some work coming uh, back. So we have um, this kind of geometric painting. The pattern at the top is called a key pattern or a meander pattern, so we talked about that. We talked a little bit about the human figure coming back into art and um, how that started and wasn't super realistic and then as we go through and get up to the classical period things become more realistic. Um, we talked a little about the orientalizing which again oriental is not a word that you use for people obviously but in terms of art history this particular style is called orientalizing and it is not a negative connotation kind of thing. It's just that um, it just means using motifs from the Near East in uh, vase painting in Greece. Um, okay, and then we got into the Archaic period and we talked about Daedalic art, all right? And so we were comparing a Daedalic art, um, you can go back and watch the lecture, but it, ha it takes a lot of cues from Egyptian styles. So we were going through and looking at sculptures from this time period and talked about different kinds of clothing. Then we talked about vase painting uh, quite a bit. And then uh, we were talking about architecture, the uh, metopes and the triglyphs and the Doric columns and Ionic columns and the entablature and all that stuff. And then the general kind of layout of archaic temples. Uh, we looked at the Temple of Hera I, which is a good example of the Doric order. Um, and this is where we left off. So here's where we're gonna pick up. So the uh, Aegina and the transition to the classical period, this is sort of the transition period between the archaic and going into the early classical. So the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, this temple. And this temple is um, the Temple of Aphaea. And it's in Aegina in Greece. And it was built between 500 and 490 BC. OK. So um, basically, let's talk a little bit about what's leading in to the classical period as we're, we're going into this period now. So let's, let's kind of orient ourselves uh, historically. Um, the classical period basically begins with a very significant historical event. A lot of these big transitions, there's some kind of thing that happens that's pretty impactful. Um, and that's the defeat of the Persian invaders by the allied Hellenic city-states. So as I talked about in the last lecture, Ancient Greece is not like what we think, what we know as modern contemporary Greece today, right? So um, as you saw on the map that I showed earlier, it's the Greek mainland, it's a little bit of Turkey, it's all of the islands, it's a little bit of Italy. So it's all these individual little um, communities, all these city-states all over that have their own government, but they all have a, the same religion, they worship the same gods, they have, uh, they're very culturally similar. Um, so they have a lot in common, they have uh, the same language, but they're not all unified. So what's happening at this time is the Persians, whoops, uh, led by uh, Xerxes, their king. Um, if any of you saw the movie 300, it's not super accurate. And the depiction of Xerxes is very interesting, but he's the villain in 300. So he, that, that was an actual guy. That was the king of the Persians. And they were just beating the crap out of the Greek city-states. They were just sacking Athens, sacking uh, all these city-states. And so all of these Greek city-states were like, hey, 
what if we get together, we could probably defeat them. Um, maybe we'd be stronger if we all get together. And so that is um, the allied Hellenic city-states. So um, Athens is occupied and sacked in 480 BC and like really sacked, like they burn everything down, like it's pretty destroyed. But right after that, the Greeks win a very decisive, very important naval battle. So you know, they're very good seagoing people. They're good uh, on the water. And they defeat the Persians at uh, Salamis, which is um, a island. Uh, and, and so right off the coast of that, that island, they defeat the Persians. This is a really difficult war and they were afraid the whole time that they were going to be completely conquered um, by Xerxes and his, his uh, army and navy and that he would end up ruling them all and enslaving them and um, bad things happened, uh, you know, in war. Um, so this big win nurtured a sense of uh, Hellenic identity and it helped foster a more unified culture among the Greek city-states. So the decades that follow are considered kind of the high point of Greek civilization, and that's going into the classical period, which is also sometimes called the Greek Golden Age. So that's where we are that kind of leads the way in. Um, and uh, we'll look at some remnants of other um, temples and examples that were destroyed that are, are no longer around that, that are similar and kind of represent this uh, culture really well. But first let's look at this one since it's still standing, we still have a, a, most of it. So um, this is the temple of uh, Thea and she is a Greek goddess um, who is local. She was a local goddess who was only worshipped um, on uh, in, in Aegina in this area. So it's kind of like, I always liken it to later in the semester when we get into um, the Romanesque and Gothic particularly, we'll talk about lots of cathedrals and a lot of times cathedrals are dedicated to Catholic saints. So there's all the like main well-known saints like the Virgin Mary for example and then there's also kind of local saints that did something miraculous at the location where the church is. So this is kind of like that. She's a local god. She's a um, She's a fertility and agriculture deity. So this temple is dedicated to her. Um, later, this kind of gets rebranded and becomes affiliated with Athena and uh, Artemis. But originally it was uh, to Athea, who is this local goddess. Um, okay, so some things to notice about this is we have uh, an even number of columns. We have six columns on the shorter ends. We have two columns in each antis. We have two rows of columns inside the cella or naos. And if you notice on the plan over here, it's very, very symmetrical. And it's very symmetrical vertically and symmetrical horizontally. And this becomes a very typical kind of thing in the classical period. Things become more uh, symmetrical. There's a lot of interest in ratios and proportion. There's a lot of kind of rules in terms of how many columns you have where, but everything becomes much more um, regulated and much more um, symmetrical. Okay, so uh, it sort of gets uh, cleaned up and prescribed that everything is going to be in this specific way. So let's take a look, and one thing that we'll talk about a little bit later is a lot of these temples no longer have their sculptures that were in their frieze or entablature or pediment and no longer have um, some of the sculptures that were inside. They were taken away and a lot of them are in museums now. And we'll talk some specifically about some of those incidents a little bit later. But basically, a lot of the ruins, you'll see the ruin and then I'll show you something that was originally part of it that isn't there anymore. So these are the east and west pediments of the Temple of Aphia. And what I really like about this is it's kind of this literal bridge um, between the archaic and the classical periods of sculpture um, because they were made a little bit apart from each other. They were made about 10 years apart from each other during this transition. And if you look closely at these, which we're going to look closely at one um, of the figures from each and compare them, you can see uh, some really definitive changes in style. Okay, so the top one is a dying warrior from the west pediment of the Temple of Aphia, and the bottom is a dying warrior from the east pediment of the Temple of Aphia. 
and notice some of the differences. So one of the first things I, in a seated class, those of you who are in my seated class and are reviewing this, um, I put this slide up and I ask students to pick out the differences. And usually the first thing they notice is that the guy on top, who's more um, in line with the archaic style, is smiling which is kind of odd because he has a spear going through his chest and he is dying. But remember we talked about last time how one of the um, sort of common elements in archaic sculpture is this weird, it's almost kind of a creepy little smirky smile and statues pretty much all have that. Okay, so we have kind of the stoic, uh, stern, sort of Egyptian inspired Daedalic body style, but then we have these weird little smiles and, um, and they, they're always looking straight forward. You'll notice that he also, though we do have some attention to naturalism in terms of his musculature and structure, he's also very stiff and doesn't look super natural, right? So he's laying on this arm and he's grabbing the spear with the other one, but it doesn't really look like he's putting any weight on that arm. He feels very stiff and unrealistic, even though they're trying to get some of the, the uh, more realistic looking musculature. And then he has that creepy weird smile. So 10 years later, they're working on the east pediment and we have this dying warrior. And we can notice uh, some differences right away. First of all, he's not staring directly at us and he is not smiling. He's unhappy, he's dying. Makes sense, right? Um, the other thing is we can see the way he's turned, the way that his muscles are portrayed in that turn, it looks much more realistic. It looks like he's bearing weight on his hip that is in contact with the ground. It also looks like he's really holding himself up on that shield. You can see the strain in his muscles, like he's trying to kind of hold himself up against that shield. And it looks much more believable. The way his body is sitting seems much more naturalistic. So you can see the big difference um, between these things, right? They, they seem, there's, there's quite a bit of difference. So we can really see in the second example that we're leaning into classicalism. One of the things in the classical periods in uh, ancient Greece is an interest in the body, is an interest in, de in um, depicting the body in a naturalized way, but also in a very beautiful, uh, consistent way. Okay, so we're gonna talk uh, a little bit about the early and high classical periods in sculpture, and then um, we're going to stop and go, and I'll, I'll, I'll chop this up again and go into a different lecture. Um, but one of the things that I wanna talk about is uh, the Temple of Zeus. So the Temple of Zeus uh, was completely destroyed. It was at Olympia and it was destroyed. We know who built it. We know it was built by uh, Leban of Illus. Uh, between 470 and 457 BC. Um, and we know a lot about it because there's a lot of descriptions, both verbal written descriptions and also drawings. So we even know what the uh, pediments uh, looked like. Um, and then we have a lot of the sculpture that was part of it survived and, and is in pretty bad shape, but it was preserved and exists. Um, so it was quite large. And in this East pediment, it's depicting this story that was quite important to the people um, of the time. And so it's, I'll just tell you kind of briefly what it is. So there's this playwright at the time that's very popular and very important, and his name is Aeschylus. And he writes a three part, a three play uh, kind of series called uh, Oresteria. And Oresteria is kind of a bestseller. It's really popular at the time. Um, and it goes through all of the tragedies that befall Pelos' family. And so all of this starts with this chariot race. And so there's a king, his name is um, Oinomanos, and he has a daughter named um, uh, Hypodinia, Hypodinia. And so um, he is told by an oracle, by a person who can see the future, that he will die when his daughter is married. And he does not want to die. So anytime someone comes and tries to um, be like a suitor for his daughter, tries to marry his daughter, he challenges them to a chariot race. And if he wins the chariot race, he kills them. And if they win, they get to marry his daughter. And it's kind of rigged because he is the son of Ares, the god Ares, and his dad, this god, gave him some divine horses. So he basically can't lose, and he knows this. So anytime a suitor comes and he challenges them to a, um, 
chariot race, it's really a death sentence for that suitor. And he does this for, for years. Um, and so uh, Pelops comes and wants to marry his daughter. And he says, okay, I challenge you to a chariot race. But Pelops has heard and knows that the king never loses and has these magic horses. So he goes and finds um, someone who works in the stables for the king. And his name, uh, the guy's name is... Um, Martellus, I think, Martellus. So he goes and finds Martellus and he says, I will pay you handsomely if you loosen some of the connections in the king's chariot so that it will fall apart and crash and he will not win in this race. And uh, Martellus is like, okay, sounds good. I'd like to make some money. I'm not that loyal to the king. Sounds great to me. So he sabotages uh, the king's chariot. But, uh, so the king loses, and the king actually dies in the chariot race. When his chariot falls apart, the horses trample him and he dies. Um, and so Pelops is like, yes, I can uh, marry the princess. I'm excited about this. And then um, Martellus comes up to him and is like, hey, you owe me money. And instead of paying him, Pelops decides to kill him. A lot of this, a lot of this in the Greek tragedies, there's a lot of betrayal and a lot of killing and things. So he kills him, but as he lays dying, he curses him. So uh, Martellus curses Pelops and says that he will curse you and your children and their children will all have horrible, tragic lives. And um, so Pelops marries the uh, princess and they have children. And one of their children is uh, Arteus. Arteus sounds familiar. That's because we looked at the thing called the treasury of Arteus that was mistakenly identified as that. It was actually a tholos or a beehive tomb. Um, but uh, Arteus, if you remember, is Agamemnon's dad. So there's all these tragedies that befall these these um, this family throughout Greek history, um, and it supposedly starts with this chariot race. So that's what's being seen here. Um, which is kind of interesting and is significant to this kind of history, right? And, and all of these things that lead into what is then the Iliad and all of the things that happen with that. So um, it's a pretty important uh, tale that is depicted here. And it's kind of interesting. So we have these figures. You can see looking at them in the close-up slide up at the top that, again, it's more naturalized as we move towards classical uh, sculpture, we see that everything is a little bit more naturalized and interest in the musculature. Um, we also see that they're quite serious. We don't have these archaic weird smiles anymore. Um, sometimes the early classical phase of Greek art is called the severe style because they're all very serious. It sort of looks like some of the um, early dynastic uh, Egyptian art that we looked at where they're very serious as well, right? Okay. So uh, also, uh, Peplos might be a familiar name. That's because um, the clothing style is named after him, which we've already talked about. OK, so the Temple of Zeus is destroyed. We just have those sculptures left of it. Um, but we do have the um, Temple of Hera II, called Hera II, because it's very close to the Temple of Hera I, which we looked at earlier. Um, and we know that the Temple of Hera II in Paestrum, Italy, was a near exact replica in terms of the architectural design. Um, the Temple of Zeus and the Temple of Hera were designed to be the same. So the Temple of Zeus was the first monument of the classical period of art and architecture. And both of these temples are pretty similar to the Temple of Aphaea, which is why I start with that one. But you can see here, looking at Hera II, we have um, all of the classic elements of the Doric order are represented here. And we can see that quite clearly in the design. Let's see. So let's look at some of the sculpture here. Um, this is another sculpture from the Temple of Zeus. Uh, so again, we have some of these. So the um, in the Doric order, remember, we have the metopes, which are um, in the entablature. You have the triglyphs, and then the metopes are the blank areas between them where there was sculpture. So that's what this is. Um, in my first lecture, I might have pronounced that metopes. I always, my brain like slips and I want that word to be metopes so bad and I <laughs> say it incorrectly. So that's not how you pronounce it. Just so you know, don't trust past me if I said it wrong because it's about a 50-50 chance that I did. Um, okay, so let's look at this uh, really lovely relief sculpture and kind of look at what's going on in it and understand it and then talk about the style a little bit. 
So um, we have Heracles, right, who uh, is quite famous, obviously. And he is the son of Zeus and a mortal named um, Alcmene. Okay, so his mom's immortal, his dad is Zeus. As I talked about when we were talking about the gods, Zeus kind of gets around a lot with a lot of different people. Um, and so his wife, Hera, the goddess Hera, hated Heracles. She was always making things very difficult for him and trying to kill him because she was very jealous and she didn't feel like she could take things out on her husband, the king of the gods, so she often took things out on his mortal lovers or their children. So like when Heracles was a baby, Hera sent snakes into his crib to kill him and then he strangles them. He's such a strong uh, child because he's a demigod that he kills the snakes in his crib. She later causes him to go crazy and causes, uh, and he um, accidentally kills his wife. So this is related to this story with Nisos that we talked about earlier. Um, so basically he's punished for this, even though it wasn't his fault, even though Hera made him do it. And he has to perform these 12 great labors. And uh, the first one is to kill the lion of uh, Nemea, the N uh, Nemean lion. I'll just tell you what the 12 of them are, just so we know what they are. Then we'll go through and explain why this, what's happening in this particular sculpture. So first he has to kill the um, Nemean lion. Then he has to slay the Hydra. Those of you who are Marvel Universe fans, Hydra is the name of the organization of bad guys that S.H.I.E.L.D. fights. If you know their little logo, that monster that has multiple heads. Um, so the Hydra is this thing sort of dragon-like and it has nine heads but if you cut off one head three more grow to replace it where where it was so that's what hydra that's where that word comes from um, so that's the second thing is kill the hydra then he has to capture the um uh Serenimian hind which is kind of it's like a mythological deer basically so he has to capture that then he has to capture the iramanthian boar which is like a magical pig basically then he has to clean the um, Aegean stables in a single day, which is an impossible task, but he does it. He has to capture the Cretan bull. A lot of capturing, a lot of capturing animals on here. He has to slay the Stymphanian uh, Phalian birds, which are monstrous birds that are like difficult to kill. Uh, the eighth one is he has to steal the mares of Diomedes. The ninth one is he has to obtain the girdle of Hippolyta. The tenth one is obtain the cattle of the monster uh, Geryon. Eleventh is to steal the apples of Hesperides. And twelve is to capture and bring back Cerebus, which is Hades' dog, so his uncle's three-headed dog. So those are the twelve things he has to do, so lots of crazy things. So basically, um, we, we get some of the things that identify Heracles as who he is from this story of his 12 labors. So he has to go kill the lion of Nemea. After that, he's always wearing the skin. So that kind of becomes one of his attributes. You often see him with this lion skin. And if you see a hero, a muscular looking guy with a lion skin, that's Heracles. Um, one of his last tasks was to steal the golden apples Gaia gave to Hera. Um, and Athena, so um, Athena's a fan of his. Athena kind of helps him out. Hera hates him, Athena likes him. And Athena's kind of his sister, right? Because she sprang out of Zeus's head and Zeus is his dad. So Athena likes Heracles and she lets him come to Olympus after the 12 labors. And the legend has it, he started the Olympic games, okay? So basically, this uh, sculpture is depicting one of these tasks, and um, there were sculptures all the way around of his, his 12 labors. So this is the one that's kind of the best preserved. And so he has to go and steal the golden apples from the garden at uh, Hesperides, which is guarded by a dragon. So it's a really difficult task. And these are apples that were given to Hera by Gaia. So these are also, a, they belong to Hera. So this is another reason that She's not pleased that he's going to go steal her apples. Um, so these labors are depicted in the Temple of Zeus in the Metopes, um, which are the little rectangles within the frieze all the way around. So this is an example of that. Um, so one of the things about this that's really cool is we start seeing how they're playing with ideas about perspective, OK? 
okay? So they're interested in naturalism, they're interested in um, showing the body in a more natural way, and they're also interested in ideas of perspective. So we have foreshortening in the bodies, we have overlapping, we have figures standing not straight on but to the side, um, and a, it becomes kind of a focus also to really look at how um, the anatomy of the body is and how it works and portraying it that way. You notice we still have our uh, women are clothed, so this is um, Athena with Heracles and Atlas with the apples of Hesperides uh, depicted here. Okay, so here's the thing I'm going to tell you about, and it's a little bit strange, but I decided, decided to include it in lectures. Um, so this is a thing that all students want to ask and, and almost nobody does. Every once in a while I have someone really brave who asks. So, um, and the thing is why are the penises so small, <laughs> okay? And um, I've had, like I said, a handful of students over the years ask me about this and just as an aside outside of class because they were really curious and didn't want to ask in front of class. So I've just decided to make it part of the lecture. So at this point, we're getting into classical sculpture where we get into um, kind of more devoted realism to the anatomy of the body and the way muscles look and proportions and things like that. And um, it's a little strange. It's kind of noticeable that generally all of the phallic, all of the phalluses are uh, very small and uh, not erect. Okay, so. Um, I'm just going to tell you why that is because I think people are generally curious about it and feel weird about asking. So the ancient Greek ideal man is not this like lustful um, lover type, okay? He's supposed to be a wise public servant. So I have some quotes in here. So Greeks associated small and non-erect penises with moderation, which was one of the key virtues that formed their view of ideal masculinity. And that's from a classics professor, Andrew Lear, who uh, has taught at Harvard and Columbia and NYU. So there's this, there's also, not only is that considered a symbol of being like, basically a, a, a scholar and an ethical man and a stand-up citizen, um, it's also this contrast that they, they put in, in the artworks, okay? So there's a contrast between the small non-erect penises of ideal men, which are like heroes, gods, athletes, all the kind of superstars of the day, and this is contrasted directly with the oversized erect penises of satyrs, which are these mythic half-goat men who are drunk drunkards and are wildly lustful and are generally um, not who you want to use as your um, like stand-up role model type person. And also various non-ideal men, um, elderly men often are portrayed as having big penises. Um, anyone who's seen as a barbarian, so like the Persians that were invading all the time, the barbarians from the north are often shown as, as having large penises because that's considered a sign of being basically um, uncivilized. So, uh, like other Greek innovations, the Greek preference for small but proportionate penises becomes the norm for artists for centuries to come. So all the way up through the Renaissance, when we look at uh, the David by Michelangelo in Art History II, for example, very disproportionately small penis to this uh, larger than life figure. And the reason is because they, uh, in the Renaissance, get really interested in the classical periods of art and copy that particular style. So, just so you know, there is a reason for that and it is intentional and it was considered a positive attribute, basically. So it's kind of interesting. So anyway, there's that. Uh, whether or not you wanted to ask about it, now you know the answer and you don't have to ask. Okay. So um, we're going to talk a little more about sculpture and then we're going to stop uh, before we get into classical, any more into classical architecture. Um, this is a really important sculpture. So this is the Critios boy um, and it was found at the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, which we're going to talk about a lot in the next lecture. It's built in uh, 480 BC. It's marble and it's two feet ten inches high. And it's really important be for a couple of reasons. The main one is this: con this is considered the first um, study of contrapposto stance. So contrapposto is where you're standing and you kind of have all your weight on one hip and you have kind of one leg forward. And instead of the stiff daedalic kind of like very stony kind of unnatural sort of stance and sculpture that we've seen 
in freestanding sculpture up to this point, this is a more natural kind of way to stand. It looks more like an actual human standing in the world. And so this becomes kind of a standard stance in uh, classical sculpture. And this is the, the first and considered kind of the best example of that development. Um, so that is largely what's going on here and why we study this guy. Other examples from the time. So these are um, the rice bronzes. Um, so they're kind of continuing this investigation into more naturalized stances that started with the Critios boy. And these are actually found in the sea. So these are bronze and they are fished out of the sea. That's where they're discovered. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they're six foot six inches tall. So these are quite large. Sorry. And you can see that again, an interest in naturalism, an interest in the way musculature and bone structure works in the body and in making um, people look more realistic here. And we see this um, continuing on in the classical period for quite some time. But these are just other good examples. There were quite a few of these found in the sea and saved. It's kind of amazing that they were just sitting in the bottom of the sea for years and are still in this good of shape. It's kind of incredible, right? Okay, so then we also have, this is quite a famous one. So this is um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, Discobolos, which means the discus thrower. So he's uh, pretty famous. He's only 5'1". Uh, the, the sculpture is only 5 foot 1 inches high. I remember the first time I saw it, I expected it to be a little bigger. And this is a Roman copy of the bronze original. So the bronze original has been lost to time, but we have this exact copy of it um, that you can see. And it's by a sculptor named Miron. So this is, again, a time when we start getting more artist names. So artists uh, start signing their work in the Greek, uh, the ancient Greek period with the um, face painters, and we see that with the sculptors as well. So we start being able to identify some of these sculptors. And this is a really common um, kind of subject matter at this time. So we had gods, we had heroes, and then we have athletes. And the interest in carving and portraying athletes nude, doing their whatever their thing is in terms of athleticism, um, is quite popular. And the reason for that is this interest in studying the nude human form and looking at the musculature and trying to develop this naturalism even further. Okay, so this guy we're going to talk about a little bit longer. So this is by um, Polycletus. He's a really important sculptor. He's maybe the most important classical sculptor. And this is the uh, Doryphorus, which is the uh, spear bearer. Okay, so his spear has been lost to time, but he was holding a spear. Uh, this is a Roman copy that was found in uh, Pompeii, Italy, after a bronze original. Again, the bronze original was lost to time. It was probably melted down and used for other sculptures or weaponry. Um, and it's rather tall. It's 6 foot 11. Um, and it was made between 450 and 440 BC. So um, this you can see, I've seen this. This is at the uh, Museo Nazionale uh, in Napoli, in, in Naples, uh, in Italy. Um, and it's one of the most, if not the most, frequently copied Greek sculptures in ancient times and classical times, also during the Roman period. Also, it was a reference for Renaissance artists and people later. This is kind of the standard of classical sculpture. Um, and it epitomizes the intellectual rigor of classical sculptural design. So we've talked about that in architecture a little bit, and we're going to talk about it more um, when we talk about the Acropolis. But um, this is kind of the standard for classical sculpture. So um, like many of these works that we're going to talk about, the original is lost. But luckily for us, the Romans really liked copying the Greeks. <laughs> we have lots of copies of it. So this particular copy stood in the uh, Palestra at uh, Pompeii, and we'll talk about Pompeii later when we get into the Roman Empire. Um, Palestra, does anyone know Palestra? The Palestra is like a um, gym. It's like a place where people go to work out. So it's like a, uh, it's like a, 
athletic school kind of or a gym, a wrestling gym where people go and wrestle. Um, and this was placed there because it was considered perfect and ideal. So this sculpture was placed at the Palestra in Pompeii as um, a model for athletes to aspire to, to try to get their physique to match this sculpture. Um, this is Polykletos's vision of the ideal statue of the male nude. Um, it was actually made as a demonstration to go with his manuscript, which was on the subject of ideal human proportions and ideal human proportions in sculpture. So he actually wrote um, a treatise, a, a manuscript about this. It was called Canon, uh, C-A-N-O-N. Why would it be called Canon? Someone have a theory? Uh, it's because Canon means the standard. Right? It means the standard of the time. It means the accepted kind of basis truth. This is the, this is the thing that we should base everything else on. This is what is prescribed. This is the, this is the real stuff. This is what we want. Um, and so he wrote this, this manuscript called Canon. Um, and then he carved this as the example, as the physical example to go with his written words. The text Canon has been lost over time, but we have lots of extensive quotes from it written by other um, people uh, throughout history. So um, there's a physician, his name is uh, Galen, and he lived during the second century and, and was a big fan of this um, manuscript. And so here's a long quote from him quoting it. And he says, beauty arises from the compatibility uh, of parts, such as that of finger to finger, all fingers to palm, palm to wrist, and of these to the forearm, the forearm to the upper arm, and in fact of everything to everything else. So what does that mean? Um, basically it means proportion, okay? So, so he's saying, and what Polykletos was saying, was that the ideal form comes down to proportion and everything needs to be proportionally in sync and this idea of ratios of the golden mean of the golden number of the golden rectangle this is all the stuff that comes out of um, Greece and he Polykletos is applying these mathematical ideas about the perfect beauty that you can find in these perfect ratios and proportions and he feels that that also applies to the human body and so one of his systems he develops is called uh, chiastic, which is also called cross balance, which is just about a balance in proportion of uh, not just the stance, not just contraposed to the way the figure is standing, but also just the proportions of the body in general in relation to each other. So he basically wants to impose order on human movement and the human body to make it perfect and beautiful. And that's polycletus. So he's pretty important. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and uh, in the next part we're going to talk about the Acropolis and go through into um, the High Classical Period and the Late Classical Period. Okie dokie.